So first of all, welcome to those joining us for Israel and the ICC, the court, the threat, and what we do now. An Israel Law and Liberty Forum conversation with three international law experts joining us tonight from the US, UK, and Israel. My name is Elena Maizel, and I am the executive director of the forum, which is a nonpartisan Israeli educational initiative founded to cultivate conservative leadership and deeper conversations within Israel's legal profession. Since the atrocities of October 7th and the start of Israel's defensive war, we have expanded our work to include discussions and publications on issues of international law and the law of armed conflict. So I invite you to stay tuned for future events of this nature. I'll say a few words of background about tonight's event, but as I said, I wanna move quickly to our speakers who I'll first introduce. So with us tonight is Professor Ord Kittry, a senior fellow at FDD and a law professor at Arizona State University's Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. He is a leading expert on international law and policy, particularly as it relates to the Middle East. He is the author of Lawfare, Law as a Weapon of War, which describes how and why law is becoming an increasingly powerful and prevalent weapon of war used by states, NGOs, and individuals. He served as a State Department official for 11 years, during which he was decorated for excellence. Professor Avi Bell is a professor at Bar Ilan University's Faculty of Law and at the University of San Diego School of Law. Um, he is among the world's leading scholars of property and intellectual property law, international law, and the economic, and economic analysis of law. He is a former president of the Israel Law and Economics Association, a former visiting fellow at Harvard Law School, among other prestigious appointments. And he currently serves as a senior fellow at the Kohelet Policy Forum and as dean of the forum's summer seminar in law and democracy. Prior to entering academia, he clerked for Justice Michel Cheshen of the Supreme Court of Israel and for the Administrative Law Department of Israel's state attorney. Last but not least, we have Natasha Hausdorf. She's a barrister in the UK and legal director for the UK Lawyers for Israel Charitable Trust. Her practice spans civil and commercial litigation, arbitration, regulatory matters, and uh, public international law. After her law degree at Oxford University and an LLM specializing in public international law, she clerked for the president of the Supreme Court of Israel in Jerusalem. She's also been a fellow at Columbia Law School in a national uh, security law program, and she's a frequent contributor on legal matters for international media, including the BBC, Sky News, CNN, Fox, and online publications. So first, thank you all for joining us tonight. To our event. Yesterday, ICC uh, Prosecutor Karim Khan requested that the court issue warrants for the arrest of Hamas leadership, as well as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, alleging the commission of crimes against humanity. While Khan's statement has drawn criticism from Israeli allies, such as the US, France, and Germany, what happens next remains unclear. So tonight, we're gonna to take a closer look at what the ICC is, its history with Israel, the implications of yesterday's uh, news for Israel and what steps are available to Israel and its allies either uh, before or after the issuance of warrants, as well as what implications, if any, this story has for other Western democracies. Q&A will follow the panel, so you're welcome, starting at almost any point, to put your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we will get to them, <clears throat> I hope, in about 40 to 45 minutes. So uh, with that, let us begin. Uh, I'd like to start, please, uh, with you, Lord. I want to unpack with you what the ICC is before we get into the substance of the current story on what authority it functions, how it functions, who's a party and subject to its jurisdiction, how it authorizes uh, prosecutions and gathers evidence, what rulings it can issue, and of course, why the US and Israel are not parties to it. Please. Thanks. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so the International Criminal Court uh, was founded uh, about two decades ago. Uh, it has 124 or so uh, members. Um, it counts Palestine as a member. I don't count Palestine as a member, so it's maybe 123. Uh, the um, uh, members of the International Criminal Court uh, do not include uh, Israel uh, or the United States. Uh, the United States and Israel 
uh, have long uh, refused to join out of concern that what would occur is exactly what has occurred, that the ICC would become politicized and be used as a tool uh, by the lawless against the law abiding. Um, the United States um, uh, presidents of both parties have refused to join the ICC. Uh, the U.S. has a particular law on the books, uh, which basically it's colloquially known as the Hague Invasion Act, which uh, authorizes the president to use all means necessary to uh, liberate and protect not only any U.S. officials that might get caught up by the ICC, but also officials of uh, U.S. allies that don't recognize the jurisdiction of the ICC. And Israel is specifically uh, listed there uh, in the law. Uh, the ICC um, has a very poor track record. Uh, it has spent over $2 billion and uh, has, uh, last I checked, less than 10 uh, substantive uh, convictions of anybody uh, anywhere. Um, with regard to um, its jurisdiction, uh, there are two arguments, two principal arguments that Israel and the U.S. make for why they're not subject to its jurisdiction. Uh, the ICC uh, uh, treaty, the Rome Statute, uh, provides that um, uh, for something called complementarity, where if you have a functioning legal system that polices uh, your own uh, personnel uh, that are uh, credibly alleged to have uh, violated uh, the statute, then the ICC has no jurisdiction uh, to go after them. Uh, Israel uh, and the U.S. also claim, uh, uh, for, with good reason, that the ICC has no jurisdiction over them because they are not parties uh, to the ICC. They chose not to join. Uh, nevertheless, here, um, we have uh, the um, warrants that were issued, uh, not issued, the uh, warrants that were applied for. What happens here is that the uh, ICC prosecutor uh, submits uh, warrant applications to the pretrial chamber, which is a group of three judges. And then they have a certain period in which they uh, look to see if the, the threshold is met. Uh, and only after they give the green light uh, does uh, do the warrants uh, move forward. Uh, the specific uh, warrants uh, for Netanyahu and, and Gallant, the specific warrant applications, rather, uh, interestingly enough, for uh, their, so far as I can tell, almost or almost entirely related to uh, accusations or of civilians. Uh, the ICC uh, did not uh, apply for warrants based on, shall we say, uh, shooting crimes. Um, there are several reasons for that, including the fact that um, uh, I think um, it would uh, more gore the ox of the United States uh, and the UK and others if you go after uh, uh, Western democratic leaders for shooting crimes, because uh, Israel, frankly, has better uh, systems in place. Uh, for avoiding, uh, you know, uh, violating proportionality and distinction, et cetera, with regard to civilians in the U.S. or U.K. has. Anyway, that's what they've uh, done. Uh, they've uh, The ICC prosecutor, uh, Kareem Khan, has gone after, um, has issued these warrant applications. Uh, it's uh, hard to tell exactly when the pretrial chamber uh, will rule. Uh, sometimes it's uh, it's a month. Sometimes it's taken uh, much longer. But that's where that's where things currently stand. Well, I want uh, to give other panelists a chance to react or to add if they'd like. Although that sounded to me like a pretty comprehensive introduction. Um, in the event that you have something to add, please do so. But if not, then I've got. All right. Next question. Um, so, in light of what we just learn. Um, looks like we may be facing a somewhat complex situation. Uh, and this is not the first time that we've had some kind of run in with the ICC. Avi, can you explain to uh, what extent Israel has already had some ICC history, um, or at least threatened, you know, lawfare prior to uh, the 2021, let's say, and how it played out? 
Yeah, so um, let me just uh, jump back to one thing that Ord said. I, I think that it was a very, uh, uh, as you said, a very comprehensive overview of what the ICC does and how we got here. Um, but uh, there, we have to understand that uh, the ICC didn't become politicized. It was created politicized. And these disputes go back all the way to the drafting of the Rome Statute. And one of the things that drove Israel away from signing the Rome Statute was a provision that was drafted specifically in order to try to move international law mm -hmm. to criminalize uh, um, Israel permitting Jews to reside in the disputed West Bank and and uh, uh, parts of Jerusalem. And um, it was clear then already um, where the ICC was going to go, that it was uh, ultra-politicized. The, the, the judges themselves are ultra-politicized. Um, they're, they're not it's unfortunate they're not well respected uh the most respected certainly not the most respected in their fields um uh the prosecutor prosecutor's office has its problems this is this is a body that's always been political so um the the problems with israel um israel's been uh on the the a long-term target for the ICC for many, many, many years. So the, the PLO started a process of trying to get um, the ICC to prosecute Israelis um, all the way back in 2009. Now, there was a problem, as Ord said, that uh, uh, Israel's not a party and therefore Israel, the, the court doesn't have jurisdiction over Israelis. And so for over the course of six years, from 2009, a little bit less than six years, uh, uh, between 2009 and 2015, the, uh, the court cooked up together with the PLO this very shaky theory on um, jurisdiction um, over a state of Palestine that could then get Israelis to be uh, defendants. This was done, by the way, with the assistance of um, uh, a group of pro-Palestinian uh, international lawyers in the world, like... Um, like William Shabbos. Um, and eventually this came up the, um, the, after a, a multi-year process, um, uh, the courts started, the prosecutor's office started a preliminary investigation against Israeli defendants on the basis of the so-called situation in Palestine in 2015. Now this went forward several years and uh, um, it, after uh, about five and a half years of this uh, preliminary investigation, the ICC prosecutor, it was no surprise to anybody, but um, uh, a few people I'll mention in a moment, uh, the ICC prosecutor asked uh, for permission to graduate this uh, to a full investigation. Now, because it was a preliminary investigation, they had to report every year on what they were doing. And so while it was called the situation in Palestine, they were quite frank about the fact that they were looking at uh, primarily, if not exclusively, at um, Israeli defendants, and they were ignoring all the crimes of the PLO, Ba'ath, and the Palestinian Authority, and had some vague references to Palestinian armed groups, which we were to understand was um, not going to include Palestinian terrorists that were working with the ICC. Right? And we get forward to, to invest the, the full investigation, and the investigation has finally produced uh, uh, suggested charges now. Now, we're where along this process has Israel tried to act? Well, as we were leading up to the, 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 the closing of the preliminary investigation, um, um, Israel had a multi-year process uh, of its best uh, uh, legal authorities and diplomats in the foreign ministry of cooperating with the staff of the ICC prosecutor's office to try to get it to understand that there is no state of Palestine and the state of Palestine that does not exist, does not have any territorial jurisdiction, and therefore it is not possible for the ICC to claim jurisdiction over Israeli defendants. And they had many, 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 many polite uh, uh, discussions, and the, uh, the Israeli uh, legal uh, uh, teams were very, very certain that they'd convinced uh, uh, Prosecutor Ben Suda of the, the merits of their decision, and then, whoops, it turns out that, that they'd been fooled that um, this was simply a way of showing that Israel had cooperated with the process, not a way of changing any of the decisions. And uh, she said that it, they, the, the ICC had jurisdiction, went to the, the court, and the court, of course, uh, the pretrial chamber of the court said yes. Now, that, well, this wasn't uh, the only one. 
There was a, a, a case where the prosecutor was asked by Comoros to um, uh, file charges against um, is, Israeli soldiers for alleged crimes in boarding a ship that was unlawfully breaking a lawful blockade of the, the Gaza coast. Uh, the name of the ship was the Mavi Marmara, was flagged as a, a Comoros ship. And therefore, uh, they said uh, crimes committed in the boarding of it could be under the jurisdiction of the, the ICC. The, uh, the ICC only has uh, a jurisdiction over extremely grievous uh, uh, crimes, over crimes of great gravity. And uh, the prosecutor thought that this was a silly case to bring as the first uh, one against Israel. Um, she wanted to close it. She was ordered to, to reopen it um, because she didn't understand properly that gravity, when applied to the Jewish state, doesn't mean, mean the same thing as it does anywhere else in the world. It means something different, and so therefore it's very grievous if the Jewish state was involved in it. She made another decision. They shut her down again, and finally, after the third time, they uh, uh, allowed the case to go. This should have told Israelis about how to view the court. It did not. Uh, and this gets us to the last thing, and I, I, I suppose this is what I'm going to cue this uh, up to <laughs> allow Natasha to take this. But um, um, after uh, uh, 2021, when the court said that okay, the investigation against Israel and okay, jurisdiction for the court, um, the uh, prosecutor began a series of uh, 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 push, push forward charge sheets against uh, Israelis. He, he threw a, a lot of smoke in the air about different ways that this was going to be done. Um, he um, opened up uh, um, this up again. He asked Israelis to cooperate with them. Um, and once again, the same legal team that had failed with Ben Suda uh, took charge and ran forward to talk with, uh, uh, um, um, with Karim Khan, inviting him multiple times to Israel, passing him reams of information, being sure absolutely that they this time it was going to work. And lo and behold, it did not. Um, now, I think that this should tell us everything we need to know about this institution and where we are going. We have to take a different course if we're going to stop this travesty of justice and relying upon the integrity of the prosecutor's office or the judges in the court um, is a big mistake. Um, a lot to uh, discuss there. Or do you have any thoughts on this before I turn to Natasha, who will take us to the current um, Actually, uh, you know the current case. No, I wouldn't have anything to add to that at the at the moment. So. Okay, great. Well, in that case, I think uh, Ali was right. Natasha, he's queued you up. I'm going to ask you to discuss uh, the immediate history of the current investigation and uh, what you think happens next. Well, thank you. A lot of this comes down to uh, that preliminary determination ruling on jurisdiction. Um, from 2021, pre-child chamber one, making that decision on a on a two to one split um, and endorsing, unfortunately, the legal acrobatics uh, that the prosecutor at the time, Fatou Ben Sudo, engaged in, in seeking to justify jurisdiction uh, on the basis that the uh, state of Palestine was enough of a state to join uh, the Rome statute. Um, there are clear criteria set out for statehood, which are internationally accepted under the Montevideo Convention criteria, a defined territory, uh, a permanent population, a government, and a capacity to enter into international relations. Uh, and it's not uh, realistically uh, put forward, I don't think, that uh, the Palestinians fulfill those. But alternative arguments, uh, and I have to say novel arguments, were introduced uh, on the question of jurisdiction to the court, uh, which were in part adopted as to the right of the Palestinians for self-determination uh, and the fact that you know, it seemed to be the right thing that the court should be allowed to pursue this. Just taking on board some of the factors that Avi has addressed, uh, I think it's really important to recognize the abject failure of the International Court of uh, Criminal Court to live up to the expectations of the international community. Uh, it has been under fierce criticism. Most recently, uh, a detailed report in 2020 that criticized the amount of money the court had spent, the uh, woeful track record it had of securing um, 
convictions uh, and the focus uh, of the court had been uh, almost exclusively on um, individuals from African states. Um, all of this has undoubtedly led to the desire to focus on Israel. Um, it's become the world's punching bag, the Jewish state, and therefore um, an optimum way for the court to seek to rehabilitate itself. Uh, so taking into account um, really what we saw um, in 2021 uh, and the, the fact that international law was being thrown out of the window, that an investigation was approved even though the court didn't have jurisdiction, that really set the scene for what we've seen most recently after the 7th of October. We had Kareem Khan uh, visiting the region. He uh, spoke both from the Rafa crossing and then later at a uh, press conference in Cairo. Uh, and he made some remarkable comments uh, for, I have to say, a fellow member of the English Bar, an individual that is incredibly well respected uh, as a criminal practitioner uh, with a long history at the Crown Prosecution Service here in the United Kingdom. Uh, he talked about the alleged crimes of Hamas, uh, those that were caught on GoPros by the perpetrators themselves and sent around the world celebrating the atrocities that they had engaged in. Um, and the prosecutor also talked about the uh, need for Israel to prove that what it was doing in Gaza was in compliance with international humanitarian law. Um, I found that shocking. Uh, that characterization as an inversion of the burden and standard of proof. Um, and that ought to have been, I have to agree with Professor Bell, an indication of the trajectory of this investigation and perhaps the motivation of the court. These seem to me to be political statements rather than ones that had legal currency. Nonetheless, uh, not only did we see cooperation uh, from the State of Israel, despite the lack of jurisdiction here. Uh, but we also very worryingly saw um, some of the families of the victims of the 7th of October atrocities uh, engaging with the prosecutor, uh, providing witness statements, making complaints to the office of the prosecutor and seeking an investigation into Hamas crimes in the territory of Israel, where the court, again, I reiterate, has no jurisdiction. And the consequence of that we saw yesterday with the approach of the prosecutor seeking to appear apparently even-handed, uh, this very English approach of both sides, um, in a situation where I have to say it is utterly morally repugnant to draw any form of equivalence between these medieval terrorists uh, who have plainly rejoiced in the atrocities they have committed uh, as against the democratically elected and accountable individuals. Uh, that uh, have formed the uh, the target of um, uh, arrest warrant applications at this juncture, uh, the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and um, and and you have Gallant. I mean, apart from anything, there are I would say two fundamental problems with uh, the seeking of arrest warrants uh, against Israelis. Uh, if you set aside the problem of jurisdiction. Uh, the first is the question of whether this case is admissible, considering the uh, very important qualification which all referenced of complementarity under Article 17 of the Rome Statute uh, in, a, in a state where law and uh, order uh, apply, where the rule of law is upheld and where there would be um, an ability and willingness of Israeli courts to hold to account anyone who had, uh, in fact, any credible allegation against them, uh, then such a request for arrest warrants ought not to get off the ground. But the other added aspect here is when we consider the conditions that apply under Article 58 of the Rome Statute, um, the reasons for requesting an arrest warrant um, also don't apply. There needs to be some sort of necessity to bring those individuals uh, into custody to either facilitate uh, the investigation and prosecution or to prevent crimes from being continued, uh, to, to name but a few. And it, there's no um, sensible, reasonable explanation that can support an application when you see it in the context of um, you know, the, the requirements uh, or the conditions that apply under Article 58. 
again, I think it leads us with the only conclusion uh, that can possibly be drawn that this is a political stunt. And the final aspect of this I would uh, refer to is the prosecutor's attempt to provide himself cover with the expert report, which was also published yesterday. Um, a panel of some celebrity lawyers, uh, many of whom have a track record of bias against Israel that was put forth in very robust terms in an article today by the preeminent legal journalist, Joshua Rosenberg, um, who picked out in particular um, the uh, comments by uh, Friedman, barrister, King's counsel here, uh, and also Baroness Kennedy, um, who have made repeated comments even after the 7th of October, which would in any other context have ruled them out entirely of being considered impartial in this respect. These are just some of the individuals that the prosecutor has relied upon uh, to rubber stamp his application of arrest warrants. And again, it leads us with the, uh, the only real conclusion here, uh, which is that the origins uh, of the court and Avi picked out the drafting of the Rome statute and how this had been uh, already um, designed in order to uh, generate new international law to criminalize the practice of um, Jews moving to Judea and Samaria of their own volition uh, as an expression of their own free will, essentially to suggest that there was a criminality attached to Jews living in certain areas simply because they are Jews. That was the situation when the court was formed uh, and that it is an ultimately and inevitably, one might think, led to the political position that was put forward yesterday in the application for these warrants is unfortunately not surprising. So just a quick question that I've seen in the audience. I normally wait till the end for this, but I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, there's a question as to what the specific charges that have been brought are or alleged. Um, well, I'm looking at the prosecutor's statement, and as far as the uh, Hamas individuals, Yaya Sinwa, um, uh, uh, Ismail Haniya, and uh, Muhammad uh, Daif are concerned, it's extermination as a crime against humanity, murder as a crime against humanity, taking hostages as a war crime, rape and other acts of sexual violence as crimes against humanity, torture as a crime against humanity, other inhuman acts as a crime against humanity, cruel treatment as a war crime, and outrages upon personal dignity as a war crime. With respect to uh, the Israelis, Benjamin Netanyahu and Yoav Gallant, um, Ord mentioned starvation of civilians as a method of warfare. There are also their additional um, uh, crimes included in the prosecutor's statement, uh, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health, uh, willful killing, intentionally directing attacks against a civilian population, extermination and or murder, um, persecution as a crime against humanity and other inhumane acts as crimes against humanity. So while starvation uh, has certainly been uh, at the centre of many of the public statements, and I believe also the interview that Prosecutor Khan gave, there are clear indications that he is alleging the targeting of civilians. And given that both the UK and the US have been, um, I would say in some respects, surprisingly robust given the other rhetoric we have heard from uh, both uh, of the respective foreign officers, um, that they have been surprisingly robust in outlining Israel's adherence to international humanitarian law. And at the very basic level that Israel does not target civilians, uh, it's even more shocking and concerning that the prosecutor would be making these unfounded and uh, utterly uh, ludicrous allegations. So I want to move the conversation forward to the question of I what, just, so, of so course, yes. Just add one, one thing uh, and then I'll, uh, so uh, as as always, um, I, I'm gonna say I'm, I'm in awe of Natasha who both has such substantive knowledge and is so eloquent in present. And I recommend everybody, you know, do as I do and watch Natasha's uh, videos and uh, and uh, other things. I mean, really astonishing, tremendous, tremendous uh, asset to the pro-Israel cause. Um, one thing I would say, and this is something that uh, I and some other analysts are sort of uh, looking at, it 
and this is sort of a minor thing, which doesn't in any way contradict any of what Natasha said, but it looks like all of the crimes alleged against Netanyahu and Galan are in the context of furthering the starvation. Now, to what degree, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, why is he doing that? Again, I think he's trying to avoid bumping up against the UK uh, and US, but I think they, uh, as I'll describe in a moment, the US and certainly is going to go after uh, Khan hard uh, in response to uh, these uh, warrant applications, uh, regardless. Um, Avi? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm sure we're going to get back to all those things uh, later. I just wanted to add uh, two s small things uh, uh, related to these comments. We have to understand about uh, uh, Karim Khan and what he is doing. So one of the things is that previously, before Khan, there was a general uh, consensus within the prosecutor's office in the, uh, of the court to um, follow a general prosecutor's rule of not bringing charges unless there was a reasonable prospect of success before the court. Kareem Khan has, a, has clearly abandoned that. Um, um, and it's not just in, in this case, you know, the, 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 the announced charges against uh, um, uh, uh, Russian leaders was also a, clearly just a political stunt. In this case, it's fairly clear that the the charges against the terrorists, Mohammed Dev, uh, Sinwar, and uh, and Ismail Ania are are intended fig leaves for the 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 proposed charges against uh, um, the Israeli leaders. And the charges against the Israeli leaders are so beyond any reasonable theory that they could prove in court, both in the the bizarre interpretation of the relevant uh, law and in the the absolute absence of any evidence to prove these 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 claims it's it's fairly clear that they don't expect ever these things to get into court now of course no no israeli leader would be foolish enough to show up and be the alfred dreyfus in, in an icc court, courtroom in in in, uh, in hague so um is moved to political stunts as a way of trying to rescue the icc um from uh, uh, <laughs> extinction, um, and uh, this is this is a very very bad and troubling development. Now the other thing, this is e even briefer, is um, Khan put out a tweet of, about a week and a half ago, and we should pay attention to it, um, in which he put out a statement which he said he basically threatened under Article seventy of the Rome Statute to put in jail anyone who criticizes or tries to block the unlawful prosecutions of the court. And um, this is mafioso beh behavior. This is um, uh, an attempted, an attempt to influence, to intimidate, to extort behavior from elected leaders in Israel, in the United States, in Britain, um, to conform to the behavior that he wants for his political stunt. This is unbelievable behavior. It's clearly criminal. And um, we can talk about this later, but it is really, really important that Khan not be permitted to get away with this kind of uh, crime boss behavior. Perfect transition, I think, to the next, well, somewhat perfect transition to the next uh, question, which is effectively what steps remain now to Israel and to its allies? Uh, with a view again to the idea that you know perhaps this um, series of events is not just uh, meaningful for Israel, but of course for the West uh, more broadly. And for that, I'm going to turn to all three of you. So we'll start with Ord and then Avi and Natasha. And if you feel comfortable, you can pretend you're actually representing the country in which you live. So go for it. So uh, yeah, thanks. I will. Um, I'll focus on the U.S. perspective. Um, the, um, there's a clear perception uh, in Washington that the ICC warrant applications for Israeli leaders threaten U.S. national security. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, since the ICC's founding, every U.S. administration of both parties has refused to join the court, fearing exactly what has happened. Uh, the ICC's proposed warrants for Israeli officials uh, would set a dangerous precedent for U.S. officials. 
the ICC happens to have an open investigation of alleged U.S. war crimes relating to Afghanistan, which the court placed on the back burner in 2021. Uh, there is concern that the president set vis-a-vis -vis Israeli officials could uh, be used to turn around and go after U.S. officials. And the... Um, uh, the uh, military community in the United States is particularly concerned about this. Uh, the military coalition represents more than 5.5 million current and former U.S. service members, and I've been in dialogue with them, and they have uh, warned that the Afghanistan investigation by the ICC could lead to the arrest, prosecution, and detention of American military personnel and veterans in foreign countries. So it's important to understand uh, that that is you know, part of the U.S. motivation here is support, and part of the U.S. motivation here is frankly uh, avoiding setting precedents that will be problematic for the United States. So the United States uh, has basically uh, four moves uh, it can it can make. Uh, it seems to me with regard to responding to the ICC. Um, one, as I mentioned, there's the American Service Members Protection Act enacted in 2002, which restricts U.S. cooperation with the ICC, provides the president authorized to use all means necessary and appropriate to bring about the release of any person described. Uh, the described persons include uh, officials of Israel. Um, you know, the U.S. has that move available to it. Uh, I don't see the Biden administration, you know, sending troops into the Hague anytime soon. But this this act uh, sets um, the, 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 the framework for how the U.S. Uh, thinks about things. Um, the act also restricts U.S. cooperation with the ICC. Now, uh, the U.S. Uh, under the Biden administration has um, edged towards the line and probably across the line with regard to U.S. cooperation with the ICC. This was principally uh, driven, I would say, by uh, the U.S. Uh, effort or interest in holding um, uh, Putin accountable for what he's doing in Ukraine. Uh, folks in Washington uh, thought, I think, mistakenly that the ICC would be useful in pushing uh, back against Putin. I think it's, it's not particularly useful. But uh, what happened is that during the Biden administration, so it's important, that the, the U.S., uh, is not a member of the ICC, so we don't provide funding to the ICC. So we can't pull funding from the ICC, uh, although I'll get to that sort of in a moment. But the U.S. does provide various types of intelligence and other practical assistance, which are crucial to the ICC's ability to operate successfully. The ICC's limited successes, you know, the less than 10 successful prosecutions that I mentioned, many of them have relied on U.S. assistance. And um, so when uh, rumors began to emerge a few weeks ago that Khan was going to um, uh, issue arrest warrants for Israeli officials, uh, there were two main threats that members of Congress made to Khan. One is we will impose sanctions and visa bans on you, which I'll describe in a moment. And the other is we will halt all U.S. cooperation with the ICC, and that actually, you know, comes with a comes with a cost uh, to the ICC's ability to operate. Uh, even uh, a bigger cost uh, on the ICC's ability to operate would, of course, be the U.S. imposing financial sanctions and visa bonds uh, on uh, Khan. Uh, 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 Avi, I think it was mentioned, Fatou Ben Souda, Khan's a predecessor who aggressively pursued political politicized investigations of the U.S. and Israel for alleged war crimes. The Trump administration had responded by imposing sanctions on Ben Souda and one of her aides. Uh, these sanctions had a bite, according to Reuters, Ben Souda, who lived in the Netherlands, abruptly found her bank accounts frozen and credit cards canceled as a result of the U.S. Uh, financial sanctions. Uh, the Biden administration then lifted those sanctions in April uh, 2021. Uh, now, um, the, there are two uh, bills 
uh, pending in Congress that would uh, force the president's hand. The president obviously has the ability uh, on his own to impose these sanctions on Khan if he wants to under the authority of the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, whether he will or won't, I think he probably won't on his own, but there are two bills uh, pending in Congress, um, <clears throat> which I helped draft, uh, which uh, would impose financial sanctions and visa bans on ICC officials who investigate or prosecute troops and officials of the U.S. or of its allies. The Senate version has been in place for a year. Um, Senator Tom Cotton, along with Senators Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio, introduced it. There's a House uh, counterpart, uh, which uh, was introduced by Representatives Chip Roy and Brian Mast uh, recently. I think that... Um, there's a strong possibility that such legislation uh, will pass um, in Congress. And uh, it's uh, powered by two things. First of all, uh, Congress is just upset uh, that uh, the ICC is doing this and would be in any event, uh, but the dialogue between Congress and Khan after the rumors emerged that Khan would go after Israeli officials have significantly, in my view, um, fanned anger in Congress. Basically, as has been reported, uh, Lindsey Graham himself said so in a tweet, um, uh, the um, members of Congress, uh, there was a letter, uh, 12 senators led by Tom Cotton, uh, threatening sanctions, uh, on Khan after the rumors emerged. I, I helped draft that letter. Um, and then um, there was also uh, a meeting in which uh, bipartisan members, eight bipartisan members of Congress, um, told Khan that if you do this, um, we will impose sanctions on you and end all cooperation. And in response to those threats, it was the understanding of Lindsey Graham and others, and I'm not telling anything out of school, this was reflected in Lindsey's tweet. It was their understanding that Khan was backing off and negotiating a deal with the Israelis. And uh, it, according to press reports, the deal was in the process of being implemented. Khan was scheduled to visit the US. His people, Tom Lynch was about to, his uh, chief of staff was about to take off and head to Israel. But Khan all of a sudden turned around and uh, moved these warrants forward, went on Christiane Amanpour, uh, did this, uh, did this uh, uh, you know, oral presentation. And uh, it's important to understand that is that betrayal of members of Congress. Um, I, 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 some of us heard from Lindsey Graham before Khan did this. If Khan moves ahead under these circumstances, uh, you know, Graham will be even madder than he would be otherwise. So it's an important story, this betrayal, because it really fuels a lot of the anger uh, by members of Congress. They don't like it when people like Khan do bad things. They especially don't like it when they feel lied to uh, by Khan. And Lindsey Graham tweet, Graham's tweet says specifically uh, that. So I think that Congress is uh, likely, certainly the House, I think, is going to pass uh, the financial sanctions and visa ban on Khan and some of his staff. Um, speaking of um, Khan's staff, uh, you saw that um, uh, Khan um, made a statement uh, uh, announcing uh, these, uh, the, moving the uh, arrest warrants forward. He had two staffers standing next to him, uh, Andrew Cayley and Brenda Hollis. Uh, Andrew Cayley was formerly a uh, top um, uh, uh, UK uh, legal official. Uh, Brenda Hollis was previously a top US legal official. Um, I think that um, if you look carefully at them, uh, they look very, very uncomfortable. And um, uh, I would say that um, watch that space. Um, and, uh, you know, I think when a prosecutor uh, takes action, um, over the strong objections of his deputies. Sometimes those deputies find ways of um, um, pushing back. Um, that's all I'll say on that front. Um, with regard to uh, the final uh, 
uh, weapon that the U.S. has. Uh, that has to do with the fact that um, uh, the ICC is largely funded by key U.S. allies, right? So two-thirds of the ICC's 127 million euro budget is provided by the following close U.S. allies. And I'm going to mention the numbers because they're important. 127 million euro budget. Japan contributes 25 million euros. Germany, 18 million euros. Right there, that is a third of the budget, just those two countries. Then it's followed by France, 13 million euros, UK, 13 million euros, Italy, 9 million euros, South Korea, 8 million euros. These countries all rely on US troops to defend them from the increasingly aggressive Russian and Chinese governments. Do these close U.S. allies really want to endanger the U.S. troops which defend them by funding the ICC's legally and factually basis, baseless, politically driven proceedings against Israel? Hmm. Uh, to a choice between funding the ICC and mm, continued uh, support from the U.S., I think there's only one way uh, that those countries can possibly decide to go. So watch that space uh, that's my um, uh, overview of from the perspective of the U.S. government. We'll move now okay. to Avi and, and Natasha. We did have a few more questions lined up, but this will be the final question from me out of respect for the time of the, the audience, which is not to say that anybody here has run long. You could easily speak for hours, each of you, and I think it would be well worth it. Um, uh, so I thank you. So we're going to, we're going to, Go to Avi and to Natasha to wrap this question up, and then we'll move to the Q and A. And as a reminder, if you have a question and then you know it's just like sitting with you, put it into the Q and A box, and we'll try to get to at least some of what's there. Although it's it's quite populated now. All right, um, I, I I will try to make this uh, uh, compressed. Um, I have five suggestions uh, for what Israel has to do, and a couple suggestions what it must stop doing <laughs> or never do. All right. So let's start with with the first. The first one is rather obvious, and the foreign ministry has already uh, announced that uh, it's intending to do this, which is a campaign of public diplomacy to work with um, Israeli allies, uh, democratic liberal, liberal states around the world, uh, to try to get them to those that are in the ICC to withdraw from the ICC, those that fund the ICC to stop funding the ICC, um, and to engage in a lot of the actions that I'm about to suggest that uh, Israel engage in. Um, this is, um, uh, it's unfortunate that this hasn't been uh, done uh, uh, um, as seriously as it ought to be until today. Um, and I hold limited hopes um, at this point for a campaign on the Israeli uh, front. I think that it, should the White House decide to throw its uh, weight behind such a campaign would have a lot more success. Um, I'm skeptical that this White House will do that. Um, all right, number two, um, Israel has to have an aggressive campaign of non-cooperation. It is a fact that um, refusing cooperation, blocking cooperation with the ICC um, has been successful for some countries, not just, not just for countries that are, are superpowers like the United States, which was very successful after putting uh, sanctions on Ben Suda and getting the, uh, uh, the ICC to reconsider its political campaign against uh, uh, American service members, um, but also countries uh, that are smaller, um, uh, countries like Kenya have had uh, success in uh, through non-cooperation. By non-cooperation, I don't mean just uh, um, refusing to invite on for visits to Israel. And again, I can't understand how in any Israeli could have agreed to do that, um, nor uh, passing along documents, which again, I can't understand why Israel ha has done these things, but I'm talking about more, more aggressively, uh, those who cooperate um, within the government should must be stopped from doing so. Um, even private citizens, to the extent that we're talking about interfering uh, uh, with foreign policy of Israel against Israeli interests, it's already on the books as a crime. Um, um, uh, you know, 
privateering on on foreign policies on the crimes is a, is a crime in many many states and this is someone that has to be uh, handled with care in order not to uh, exceed the bounds of uh, proper behavior for a liberal liberal democratic state but the um, um, israel could certainly use uh, legislation of the American kind, the American Service Members Protection Act, which uh, Ord uh, said uh, uh, accurately is referred to colloquially as the Hague Invasion Act, um, and and other legislation, in, which I know has been kicking around in the Knesset for some years. It's long past time to adopt it. Um, number three is uh, sanctions against uh, personnel. Uh, Ord mentioned uh, the, the basics, uh, uh, sanctioning bank accounts, sanctioning, uh, uh, refusing uh, uh, visas. Um, um, I think that this is uh, obvious and needs to be done. It's also obvious, by the way, that Israel's uh, uh, ability to play this game is much more limited than a country like the United States or even the UK. Um, um, number four is uh, criminal charges against uh, personnel of the uh, uh, ICC prosecutor's office and the, the even the ICC itself. I, I would not do this recklessly. I would do this for the real crimes that uh, they are committing. At the moment, um, what they are uh, um, threatening, they're, they're carrying out uh, um, extortion by threat and um, uh, um, threatening improper and unlawful legal procedures. They're threatening um, international kidnapping. Um, they're saying they're starting to take into custody people they have no jurisdiction over. Um, and arguably they're engaging in uh, uh, not, not just material support for terrorist organizations, but actively cooperating with Palestinian terrorists in cooking up these false charges against Israel. Now, the, all these are quite reasonable grounds for uh, uh, criminal charges, certainly much more justifiable grounds than any of the things that the ICC prosecutor's office has, has issued. And um, it's, it's time to, to actually uh, start pushing some of these forward and exploring whether there's room for putting these people on, on trial. Uh, and finally, uh, the fifth, fifth one that should be done um, there's, this one strikes me as uh, remarkable that it hasn't happened, and, and I'm not the first person to, to, to note this. There's, there's legislation in the United States um, that uh, uh, sanctions the PLO should it take a move to initiate uh, uh, criminal charges against Israel in international uh, courts. And, um, you know, the PLO did this more than, um, uh, at this point, about 15 years ago, um, and the, the threat was of, of sanctions was never carried out. Um, and at this point, of course, it's, it's pointless because the ICC prosecutor acts on its own. The, 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 the PLO did all that it had to do when it gave the, the authorization, when it joined the treaty as the so-called state of Palestine. Um, but it's not too late here. And it's particularly because the ICC prosecutor's uh, uh, theory of why he's able to bring up Israelis on, non -charge, on charges of non-crimes is because he has jurisdiction over the situation in Palestine because he says there's a state of Palestine. And if the state of Palestine withdraws its uh, um, um, assent to, withdraws its pa participation in the treaty, there goes the ICC uh, prosecutor's excuse. Now, what are the chances of it? They're not great, but let me tell you that the, uh, the, the PA, the PLO, is vulnerable to pressure, uh, especially pr pressure from the United States. It is a, an economic basket case. Besides being uh, highly staffed with terrorists and funding terrorist organizations, it has very few independent sources of, of funding other than the, the, the Swiss bank accounts. Um, and uh, and that means that if sanctions, serious sanctions are put on the uh, PLO and the PA, it's very difficult to see them proceeding in this reckless course of lawfare. And I'll just say very briefly then the two things uh, uh, that Israel must absolutely stop doing and not do. Okay? Number one is it would be a big mistake for Israel to engage in any more legal argumentation before the court that gives the, 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 um, um, the court uh, uh, legitimacy is if it engages in legal processes, which at least with regards to Israel, it is not. All it is doing is political theater, and it is using le legal rhetoric in order to try to dress this up. Um, it, Israel's already played this game once. It made the mistake of indirectly submitting arguments regarding jurisdiction, which were completely brushed aside uh, by the court and by the prosecutor. Um, there is no, no, no need whatsoever to uh, engage in this again, which brings me to the second one. It is a big mistake to engage in any way or fashion with the ICC uh, behind the scenes, 
in front of the scenes to negotiate, to pass along information, to try to uh, speak with them as if they're reasonable people. What you can see by the story that uh, 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 Orr told is, uh, uh, and accurately, by the way, about um, behind the scenes contacts uh, to try to reach a, a deal. This is not the first time that it's happened, by the way, um, is that the interest of the court in such things is, is um, to uh, throw smoke, to distract um, uh, while it engages in unlawful and unethical uh, behavior behind the scenes. And also afterwards, in order to make a false argument that it's everything that it's doing is, is objective and carefully thought out and uh, um, uh, relying upon evidence. There is no reason to give them uh, uh, this smoke screen. There's absolutely no reason to give them the opportunity to polish the lies that they're going to tell in their, their process. Uh, uh, fooled me once, shame on you. Fooled me twice, shame on me. Okay. Um, we have, in fact, run long. So, Natasha, yeah. as a person I'll, I'll keep with it the best accent on this call. I'm not sure about that. But I, I would just, uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, caveat uh, everything so far, um, and just with this, that uh, Professor Kittry, Professor Bell and myself, as upholders of the rule of law, would certainly not have been making any of these suggestions had the court been, in fact, applying international law, acting uh, within uh, its jurisdictional limits on the basis um, of the Rome Statute, which set up this court. But I think all of these suggestions are legitimately put forward in regard to a court that has uh, very badly lost its way and is, in fact, abusing international law for political purposes. Uh, and with that, of course, the UK, as the uh, member of the International Court of uh, Criminal Court, um, a signatory to the Rome Statute, um, notably does have particular sway uh, and I think if it were to take a particular position, could have a significant degree of influence, despite the fact that an international court is supposed to be independent. Again, that is very relevant where uh, the approaches of uh, an international legal institution have plainly gone off of the rails. I think the real problem is that um, the matter has become a partisan issue. And you can see this from the re reactions today, um, the difference between that of the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak gave a very short statement where he said there is no moral equivalence between a democratic state exercising its lawful right to self-defense and the terrorist group Hamas. It is wrong to conflate and uh, uh, equivocate between those two different entities. Um, I'm sure it could have been much stronger, but still a statement that uh, highlighted concern with the prosecutor's approach. If you contrast that with the position taken by the shadow uh, foreign minister, David Lammy, and if you are to believe polls, uh, most likely to be uh, the future foreign minister, um, the position taken by Labour as a whole um, is that it supports the independence of international courts and the prosecutor's application for warrants, as well as the ICC's jurisdiction is a matter for the ICC. But I would very strongly advocate that there are UK interests at stake here uh, as a member of the Rome uh, Treaty um, if this court is in fact acting out with its jurisdiction and pursuing a political agenda because it is law-abiding states that stand to be the targets of political attacks of this nature because they are the ones uh, to take this court more seriously and to seek to abide by international law more generally. Um, we've already discussed the lack of impact that the court's approach uh, to uh, Putin in particular vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Russian uh, potential defendants has not been particularly effective at all. Um, I would only add that I have just today come back from Australia and in my time there, I had marathon meetings with um, many politicians uh, where the ICC was a topic of conversation, of course, even before these warrants were applied for. Um, and I am encouraged that a number of senators in Australia, it's also a party to the uh, Rome Statute, um, had also written, uh, in similar terms to Prosecutor Khan, highlighting uh, their serious concerns with the approach that was being taken vis-a-vis -vis the investigation. Uh, and uh, one can only hope 
that those concerns will be reflected now across a, a broader part of the political spectrum in Australia. Um, unfortunately, the party, um, the Labour Party, hasn't been particularly um, mindful, I would say, so far, it seems, of uh, the lawfare agenda uh, against Israel. In particular, its vote at the last General Assembly uh, resolution indicates that um, that the government itself may not necessarily be following uh, the very sensible recommendations of of Ord and uh, and of Avi, uh, but there is certainly more that states such as Australia, such as the UK, as members of the court, are in a position to do. Uh, I can't say that I'm holding my breath to see significant action there. I think it's bound to come uh, more robustly and more significantly uh, from the United States and, as I hope, from Israel also. So, um, first of all, thank you for what I think is a fascinating presentation. Um, I am going to ask some audience questions, although I know that we've hit the hour mark and people have to leave. So we'll continue for about another 10 minutes. Uh, as I said, I we really want to respect people's time. And um, to the extent that we can, I'm going to try to merge some of the questions that I've, that I've been reading uh, as, as we've been speaking. Okay. Um, so there's a question that arises uh, as to the credibility of the ICC institution. There are a couple of questions actually on either side of, of this one, which is, you know, has the ICC effectively shot itself in the foot or are we kind of in a bubble right now speaking to ourselves? You know, is this a patently clear violation that will effectively lead to the the institution being considered broadly illegitimate? Um, and the kind of other side of that is that despite what we're saying, the ICC is being reported on as a legitimate uh, judicial institution and as a as a, a legal voice. Um, and people are wondering, you know, in what way they can challenge the credibility that at the very least is being conveyed by the media. So who wants to jump in? I can say something. Oh, no, uh, go, go ahead, Lord. Okay. No, I, I um, just go ahead. Um. Okay, Ord. <laughs> All right, thank you. No, I just say, look, I mean, in terms of the credibility of the ICC, um, I can speak from the perspective of the United States and Washington. I would say that the uh, sitting here, it looks like the ICC has indeed shot itself in the foot. Uh, you know, two months ago, uh, the ICC enjoyed a very cordial relationship with the Biden administration. The Biden administration was providing them with all kinds of uh, data and information to be used against Putin in other cases. Uh, the U.S. has the ability to, uh, you know, sometimes say, oh, look, so-and-so suspect is over here. Why don't you ask so-and-so to arrest them, right? I mean, all of this is very valuable to the ICC, and there were no sanctions in place uh, on the ICC, but uh, right now, uh, with regard to the U.S., uh, the U.S. is furious. And it's not only uh, Republicans, but also many Democrats. Uh, uh, Biden uh, said what the ICC did was outrageous. And I've been watching carefully what members of Congress are, are saying. And there are a number of important centrist members of Congress who are hammering the ICC for this. And I think the ICC is going to pay a price in the United States. For sure, any cooperation it receives from the United States is over. That is clear. Uh, what are the chances that sanctions are imposed on the ICC? I think they're quite strong, actually. I think uh, legislation is quite likely to pass, and I don't think Biden's going to veto it. Um, and the U.S. is going to be very motivated to pressure those allies I mentioned who fund the ICC to use their leverage. So I think with regard to the United States, the ICC has indeed shot itself in the foot. In terms of what people people can do. Um, I think obviously, if you're an American, you can write to your member of Congress. If you live in the UK, you can write to your 
member of parliament, uh, I would say that um, there are relatively few people who, like Avi, Natasha, and I, are out there on a day-to-day -day basis laying out the arguments for why the ICC, what the ICC is doing is wrong. And I would recommend that other people, attorneys, but also non-attorneys, um, should be, you know, taking note of what we say and echoing those arguments in Twitter and op-eds, et cetera, et cetera. One thing that I would sort of reiterate, which I alluded to briefly, is that the military establishment in the United States, I think probably also the UK and Australia, is very concerned about what the ICC is doing to Israeli officials. So if you want to know who your allies are, it's, uh, like I mentioned, US uh, veterans and serving officials and retired JAGs and current JAG, JAGs, judge advocate generals, uh, military lawyers. So those are potential allies who should definitely be reached out to. Avi. Yeah. Um, so I lost my, my my train of thought here. So the the court is, um, I think, very clearly uh, 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 misbehaving. I think that the, uh, when we uh, look back in history, we're going to look at this as the 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 moment. This is sort of the the League of Nations during the 1930s. This is the moment when you have a, an institution that uh, has fine rhetoric and was looked at as perhaps something that one one day might become effective. Uh, to do something good will clearly never become that. Um, Kareem Khan has gone beyond that. Instead, you know, is um, in order to try to show that the court is doing something, it was previously seen as completely ineffective and not acting against the the world's worst criminals. Instead, he's turned it, it into a political clown, um, where it goes after uh, uh, high 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 profile targets in order to get into the newspapers uh, without any prospect of, of, uh, of success and in some cases quite immorally. Now, there's, if you're thinking about how to deal with this, um, um, you should think that there's, there are two different ways depending on where you stand on the ICC. I happen to have always been a pro critic of the, uh, the ICC. I've always been skeptical about it. Um, and I would be perfectly happy to see the ICC go in the direction of its suicide, which is what it's committing right now. There are others, though, who have always uh, thought that the ICC had more promise than that and who do look at the ICC as doing something positive. They, they, you know, the, the way to see this is think about a, a, a regular, an ordinary court of law in Alabama in 1910, where it's very good at certain kinds of disputes. But if a black man is charged with killing a white, a white woman, um, it's very clear what the outcome is, and it doesn't make a difference how good they are on contract disputes. And if you think that that's what the ICC is, that it's capable of doing good on other disputes, but on this one, it's hopelessly biased and terrorist supporting and disingenuous and uh, uh, dishonest, then um, you should be pushing all the harder for the ICC to drop this direction. Um, and then there's the very last thing. Let's understand that the the, the way these the, this case is made up is the way that all the cases are made up against Israel in the UN, the ICJ, and all these uh, uh, various organizations. And it, it's based on three different elements. Now, one of them is the attribution of evil motive to Jews, right? And it's un, it's you you can't do anything about this because it's unprovable and un, undisprovable. You know, it's saying that the the Jew the Jewish leaders intend to starve Palestine. Palestinians, even though it's completely false, how do you prove what's in anyone's mind? So one of those false attribution of motive. Number two is, is false statements of, of fact. Now, um, this, the, this intent to starve that's been going on for allegedly for, for, for a half a year, doesn't somehow or another doesn't actually seem to prove to, to re result in anybody uh, starving. But there's, there's a whole machine by which these stories and narratives are put together uh, uh, in which there's evil things that are done by Jews. Um, which uh, again, don't ever get proved. And then, then there's the last thing is, the, is wrapping the law around these distortions where the, the ICC creates the law that if Israel abides by the rule of humanitarian supplies in, in war, but we attribute to it false motives and we say that starvation is imminent, then all of a sudden the law makes this uh, a crime. And you, the, this, you know, this identifying the, the way that these cases are put together is key because the ICC is not the only one. You have to take this knowledge and move it elsewhere. You have to use it to evaluate the anti-Israel uh, claims of the UN, of the ICJ, and others.
those are two extremely comprehensive answers. The only only aspect I would seek to add is to encourage people to look at the facts. And when I look at the most recent COGAT update as to the humanitarian initiatives, uh, and this is in the context of this obscene allegation of intentional starvation, the total number of trucks that have gone into Gaza uh, with Israel facilitating that is 29,746. That's 572,300 tons of humanitarian aid. The majority is food. And the analysis I've seen along the way from the World Food uh, Organization is that this um, is multiple factors of what they estimate the humanitarian need is uh, for the provision of food for the entire population of the Gaza Strip. Um, it's certainly well documented that that aid is being diverted by Hamas, stolen by Hamas. So whether or not it's reaching the civilians that need it, I think there can be legitimately a question mark over that. But Israel's contribution to this humanitarian aid uh, initiative and facilitation of that aid is a matter of public record. Uh, and people need to arm themselves with the facts in order to, I think, follow the very sound advice of Avi and Ord uh, in combating the misinformation, not just at the ICC, but across all of the international legal institutions that are being abused as part of this political campaign against Israel. On that note, um, I'll do moderator's privilege and finish with one last question. I think it's worth restating um, what the law is on the provision of humanitarian aid during warfare. Um, and for that, <clears throat> Natasha, if you feel comfortable, you're wel welcome to do it or either of our other two experts. But um, it sounds from, from a lot of what you've all said that uh, the law itself is not being applied. So what is it? Well, under Article 23 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, there is a requirement to facilitate aid in this context. Uh, however, it is caveated so that that requirement essentially doesn't apply where there is a fear that that aid is being diverted. Um, now, there is clear, uh, clear evidence of diversion by Hamas, by humanitarian NGOs, by uh, other states that have been monitoring the situation, uh, and by Israel. Uh, even Fatah has officially uh, declared that Hamas are um, not just stealing aid, but also shooting uh, aid workers in order to generate a humanitarian crisis. And um, in that situation, it appears to me that the requirements of Article 23 uh, do not apply. They are in fact caveated. And nonetheless, Israel is, as usual, going above the requirements of international law and continuing to facilitate aid in these circumstances. Can I add two things? Number one, um, it's not, there's another reason why um, it's questionable whether Israel is uh, required, perhaps it's not even permitted to pass along aid in this this case, and it's because the Gaza Strip is under the rule of a of a terrorist organization, and there is international law uh, regarding uh, providing material support to a terrorist organization. And so, when Israel passes along humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip, knowing that it will be diverted to Hamas, it is providing support to the terrorist organization, and that's unlawful. Now, I would say, you know, in Israel's favor, that it it does have the excuse that it's doing so under extortion, and uh, perhaps giving something under extortion is not uh, uh, support that's punishable in the way it would be that, for example, uh, 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 you know, the, it, Qatar is giving uh, aid to Hamas. But... Um, but there's strong reasons why Israel should not be providing and should not be facilitating, but it is anyway. But then we get to the second part of this, and this is the second edition, is let's understand that the rule does not say that if you don't facilitate properly, then you've committed the war crime of starvation. Or if you've not facilitated properly, then that constitutes targeting the civilian population as such and a warm crime of distinction. These are completely made up, right? There's no reason to connect one with the other. The reason I think that the ICC is doing this is, is connecting the two, taking what it claims is a violation, falsely claiming, is a violation of the rules on, on humanitarian provision and turning it into other war crimes is to try to twist this into something over which they have jurisdiction. They don't have jurisdiction over the, the, the rules of facilitating humanitarian aid. And second of all, they're taking advantage of Israel's naivete. Israel has naively gone along with the efforts to provide humanitarian aid, even though the law is clear that Israel does not have to. And in doing so, Israel's feeding this narrative 
as if it is responsible for the plight of Gaza civilians that is created wholly by the misdeeds of Hamas. Israel, by being naive and trying to help them, is inf- inadvertently facilitating the blood libels by people like Karim Khan. I think it's strong not to conclude on. Um, again, I want to thank all of our speakers. Uh, it's really, really tremendous uh, conversation. I'd like to thank those that joined us. In answer to some of the questions we've gotten, yes, there will be a recording and we will circulate it to anybody who registered for this event. Um, and I encourage you to, uh, as Ord was saying, watch this space for uh, future such events. Um, I uh, I hope we won't need to reconvene the panel, but I'm sure we will. Um, and uh, that's it. Good night from Jerusalem.